you're going to make opening remarks, right? And you had something else that. Uh, good evening, friends. It is a gift to have you all here this evening, but I know that it will be a gift to you to hear our conversation between two panelists that we got to hear from last year and who spoke so encouragingly and hopefully that um, it seemed obvious and in fact necessary that they should be uh, back again together tonight. Um, so uh, I won't say much to keep us from getting started, but those who are members of the um, broad Christian family um, might today have celebrated um, the Sunday of the Transfiguration of Jesus, that is the Sunday uh, before the beginning of the season of Lent, uh, marks a very uh, odd and unusual uh, moment in Jesus' life when he takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a high mountain. Have you heard of key leaders in this tradition going up on top of a mountain? Um, it's a place of significance and disclosure. And uh, while he's up there, he is transfigured. He's changed in some ways before them. The, the Gospels describe it differently. His clothes were white or even his face shined. There's another story in the Bible about someone whose face shined after um, uh, an encounter with God. Um, and while three of them went up the mountain with Jesus, there are two more who appear suddenly as out of nowhere, Moses and Elijah, the last of whom was seen on earth about a thousand years before, um, are there with Jesus and in some conversation. This shocks, surprises, and terrifies the disciples um, who, who sort of fumble through their response to that moment. And, and it occurred to me just this week that on the Sunday of the Transfiguration, the topic for tonight was Moses and Jesus in dialogue. And I thought, we should put a chair out for Elijah. <laughs> um, without further ado, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. You are in good hands with each other, and we are with you. Thank you so much. In the Jewish tradition, Elijah gets the cup on the table at the Passover Seder. So we, we all have something saved for Elijah. Welcome all. Uh, wonderful to see you. We have two very distinguished scholars to discuss and educate us tonight. Uh, on my right, Professor Daniel Smith Christopher of LMU. Uh, and on my left, Professor Marvin Sweeney of Claremont. Both are world-known, uh, well-recognized, highly published, wonderful teachers. And I can't say enough about them, so we'll, make, we'll get them to work. Uh, last year, we talked about the difference in the way Christians and Jews read prophets. And it was very eye-opening to go through that. And I think that there is, that this program tonight should open with some discussion of prophets uh, as a natural follow-on to, to last year. Um, and I have some quotes from the New Testament uh, that I, I think illustrate what's going on. Uh, Mark 7, 6, 7, 7 quotes Isaiah 29, 16. And in it, Jesus, it says, Jesus says, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites, that is written, and then the quote which comes from Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. And I think that's very much a, a drawing line between ethics and ritual, which uh, 
was one of the main emphasis of the prophets, the, the ethics part of it, which seems to get lost today. And uh, Marvin, you want to comment on that, please? Sure. Uh, first, uh, let me just observe, I think Elijah does have a seat here. I just noticed that uh, there's a chair with a cushion on it, which is the typical seat for Passover, so I'm guessing that's Elijah's chair over there. Having said that, it's important to bear in mind that when we're dealing with prophets, uh, particularly in the Hebrew Bible, prophets are frequently trying to explain the political as well as the religious. And when we think of a prophet like Elijah, who spoke during the time of the Aramean invasions of Israel, he's trying to explain why that's happening and what Israel needs to do in the face of foreign invasion. And for Isaiah, quoted here in Mark, Isaiah is trying to explain or interpret what it means for Judah to be invaded by the Assyrian Empire and how Judah should respond to that. And when you take the image forward into the Christian uh, uh, scriptures, uh, looking at Mark, the political problem there is invasion of Judea by the Roman Empire and how then to respond to it. So each of these prophets, including Jesus, are attempting to deal with the threat to the homeland of a foreign aggressor how to respond. Elijah would argue, hold fast to God, and in doing so, recognize God as the creator who's going to feed people if one adheres to God and defeat enemies. Because one of the things you see in the Elijah and Elisha traditions are examples of visionary experience in which the prophet either Elijah or his disciple Elisha will open the eyes of people and reveal a divine army ready to protect. In the case of Isaiah, he confronts King Ahaz of Judah while he's inspecting the water system of his city in preparation for a combined invasion by the Arameans and even Israel itself and arguing, hold, have faith in God because if you understand the strength of your defenses here, you can wait these people out and you don't have to do anything but hold fast. And in the case of Jesus, uh, he's willing to uh, uh, throw around charges of hypocrites quite a bit as we read them in the Gospels, but Isaiah did quite a bit of that as well. And then the question would be, how do Jews respond to the threat of a Roman invasion which during the course of two invasions of Judea, uh, one that destroyed the temple in 70 CE, and then the Bar Kokhba revolt that basically resulted in genocide against the Jewish people, that this would be a very real threat to the future of the Jewish people that the various movements in Judaism were trying to address. Comments on prophets uh, and how they're how they're heard in, in the early part of the, the life of Jesus. I think it's interesting to point out that Jesus uses the prophets, quoting Isaiah, you think of a passage like Luke chapter 4, where Jesus comes to, it says his own synagogue, and he reads the famous passage from Isaiah the prophet, and it has to do with the kinds of things that are characteristic of the coming of the kingdom of God. Um, the blind will have sight, the poor will be cared for, etc. And it seems interesting that we move from a New Testament emphasis on prophecy as a kind of ethical identification of the mission and work of Jesus. But what happened in the Christian tradition, I, in my opinion, sadly, is that the Christian tradition moved towards using the prophets to talk just about who Jesus is and less about Jesus' actual mission and the characteristics of his mission. And so even the word prophecy 
has come to mean long-range prediction. And that's because us Christians, we, we tend to haul out a few passages out of Isaiah that sound like long-range predictions about Jesus. And we read them at Christmas, and then we put away our prophets for the rest of the year till next Christmas, when that was not really the use of the prophets in the New Testament. The use of the prophets in the New Testament was to, was to understand the nature of the Jesus movement. That is, what is it we're called to do? And it eventually in time evolved into using the prophets to identify who Jesus is and less about what we're supposed to do in relationship to that. So in, in my view, I think the Christian use of the prophets, uh, I think arguably from, from, from an interest in ethics, our use of the prophets has deteriorated. In other words, it, it's less robust about the actual content, the, especially the ethical content, of what the prophets had to say. And I think that in many ways that's unfortunate. Because the prophets were not simply about predicting the coming of Jesus. They were also telling us about what was the nature of what it is that Jesus intends to do. And what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. And so I think that there's a much richer sense in which the prophets have on occasion played a role in Christian theology. But we have a danger of rather conveniently ignoring that part of prophecy and only using the sort of long-range predictions, which are very rare in prophets anyway. Um, so I think that Christian use of prophecy is a rightly controversial area and probably ought to be a little bit more controversial than it is. Well, you're doing your role in <laughs> making it such. Marvin, we need an understanding of what Judea was like in the time of Jesus. The various... It was a Jewish land, but there was a lot of disagreement among the Jews as to the type of worship should exist and what the, what they should do. Can you go through, the, set sure. the stage for this, please? Sure. Um, the fact that there's disagreement in Judaism should come as no surprise to anyone. <laughs> um, we have our different movements. They don't agree with each other. And I think Protestant Christianity has some similar analogies, uh, different understandings of what Christianity should be. Uh, in the case of antiquity, um, and particularly around the year 30 CE, um, the major problem facing the Jewish people was the Roman Empire. Um, throughout the, uh, the biblical period, uh, what Christians might consider to be the Old Testament period, Judah and Israel had been independent kingdoms, and both of them were destroyed by foreign invaders. Israel by the Assyrian Empire, the northern part of what is now Iraq, and Judah by the Babylonian Empire, the southern part of what is now Iraq, and had suffered invasion by other superpowers of the day. Judah and Israel were small nations, and the superpowers sought to take them over, much as superpowers seek to do in the modern world as well. But what happens uh, in the case of uh, 30 CE, after a period of time in which Jews had actually achieved independence, uh, under the Hasmonean dynasty for which we celebrate Hanukkah, which is a festival of independence for the Jewish people, because of conflict within the Jewish people and because of Roman imperial interest, Judah lost its independence in 63 BCE when the Romans came in and took over uh, and ended an 80-year period of Jewish statehood. And as Roman rule deepened um, and became more and more oppressive because the Romans saw Judah as a source for revenue and they also saw it as a place at the end of the, of the edge of their empire. Um, Romans saw Judah as a place that did not, that they did not want to be at, simply a place to grab cash, uh, grab power, uh, define the borders, and consequently uh, Jews feeling the pressure from the Romans began to think, what do we do? 
Judaism is a religion of idealism. How do we ideally live Jewish lives, both politically and re religiously? And so in 30 CE, you've got a number of different Jewish movements. The orthodoxy of the day would be a group that is known largely in English renditions of Greek as the Sadducees. These were the Zadokites that represented the temple priesthood who believed that because the temple represented the holy center of creation, that if the temple did its work properly, that creation, peace would be gained through creation, the world would work ideally by a combination, not ritual opposed to ethics, but ritual and ethics working together. For example, how do you take care of the poor? You think about time in terms of the Sabbath. Every seventh year is a jubilee year, or is a, a year of release. The fields lie fallow, poor people get to take food from those fallow fields, and also that principle then goes through with leaving the corners of the fields unharvested so the people have something to eat. Other groups, um, such as the Pharisees, uh, which became the rabbis of ancient and contemporary Judaism, maintained that proper Torah interpretation was what was needed. And so one thing to remember is that while Torah is frequently understood as law in Paul, that is actually an incorrect interpretation of Torah. Torah means instruction. Law is part of it, identity is part of it, and that question of how to lead an ideal life. And so when you think about laws that deal with um, uh, what we call debt slavery, man goes into debt, he might have to serve uh, as a debt slave for a period of six years and goes free in the seventh. And if you think, how could they have debt slavery in the ancient world? Open your wallet, take a look at your American Express or your MasterCard or Visa, you are indebted. If you pay it off every month, great, and if not, you are a debt slave. And so a man would go into, into debt slavery for a period of time, work off his debt, and then go free. But what happens at the end of that period if you observe the law in Exodus? He has nothing to start over with, and recidivism is a problem. The Pharisees would argue, if you look at changes in Torah instruction, such as Deuteronomy, that looks at this problem and says, what happens if a man goes into debt? Well, his debtor or his creditor must give him a portion of the profits he made for the creditor. That way the man has the possibility to get out of debt again. And women would go free in Deuteronomy. Basically, the Pharisees or rabbis argued that Jewish Torah is an ongoing enterprise much like American law. For those of you who might be attorneys out there, it's a growing tradition that seeks to resolve problems in society and achieve the ideals that Torah is supposed to achieve. Others thought we need to fight the Romans. And so some of them would argue there would be an apocalyptic war, a group called the Essenes, who founded, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls and founded a community in the wilderness, observing the statement in Isaiah, go out in the wilderness and prepare a way for the Lord. They went out to the wilderness, they studied Torah, and they prepared for the time when the war of the sons of light would take place against the sons of darkness, which they understood to be a war against the Romans, drive them out. And then, of course, you also had the zealots, who were closely related, uh, who then were the ones who actually organized the people for revolt against the Roman Empire on two occasions in the land of Israel and one in the diaspora. So those represent four different movements within Judaism, each with their own distinctive understanding of what Judaism should be and how it should meet the threat of Rome. Zadokites, the temple. Pharisees, ideal society understood through Torah. The um, uh, Essenes at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, go into the wilderness and prepare to sanctify the world, and the Zealots fight now.
Those are just four. There are other groups as well, but that gives you an idea of the different movements in Judaism in 30 CE. And where does Jesus fit into this spectrum? Where, where would he be comfortable and what is he saying about the other sex? I've always been partial to the interpretive tradition that arose in the 70s, 1970s, that essentially identified Jesus as a Pharisee and placed him within that camp that if you looked at the various uh, partisan groups, the various groups that uh, Marvin has, has uh, so effectively described, and you simply ask the question, well, which one of these seems the closest to the expressions and indeed the life of Jesus as described in the Gospels? And what you get as a result of asking that question is a rather striking result, and that is both in behavior and in teaching, Jesus is a Pharisee. He seems to have uh, debates within the Pharisaic camp, as it were, but those debates are well within the uh, uh, parameters of Pharisaic Judaism. And for me, this was really brought home the first time in, uh, uh, that I had an opportunity to study one of the great rabbinic teachers of the first century, just about a generation after Jesus, the uh, youngest student of Rabbi Hillel, who is Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And the more I learned about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the more I realized this rabbinic teacher is extremely close to the character, to the compassionate sense, the interpretive traditions, very much in the tradition of Jesus. And so, basically, the only thing I would add to what Marvin has described as the four parties of Judaism in the first century, I'd add a fifth one. The Christians, because at least in their first generation, what was Christianity? It was another form of being Jewish. And we in the Christian tradition mustn't forget that Christianity did not become a Gentile movement predominantly until well into the second century. And then it becomes a Gentile movement. But in the first century, Christianity is, for all intents and purposes, an interpretation of Judaism that stood in relationship to a variety of others. And if you were to ask, and which interpretation of Judaism does Christianity and the followers of Jesus come the closest to, the answer is immediately obvious, Pharisaic Judaism. And that was, that was shocking for Christians who were raised to hear that Pharisee means the bad guys. Because I remember reading about this and, and what a shocking thing it was for me when this fellow, actually a Catholic priest who was a scholar of the New Testament, John Polakowski, and he made a very interesting proposition. He says, every time Jesus turns around, there's a Pharisee. And we've been taught that that's because the Pharisees sent spies to argue with Jesus. And Father Polakowski says, that's not why every time Jesus turned around there was a Pharisee to talk to. It's because Pharisees saw in Jesus a common teacher. And they were among followers. And so he turns around and he's in dialogue with other Pharisees. Not that he's attacking. We've completely misread this. And that the attacks, that is, particularly in the Synoptic Gospels, the attacks can very much be read as an intra-Jewish squabble between one Jewish teacher and Jewish followers. And so it seems to me that we've been in a process, especially as I say since the 1970s, when this particularly became an important way of thinking for Christian scholarship, We've been in a process now of much more effectively 
recovering the place of Jesus within Jesus' own Jewish context of the first century. I think that's been a very important move for us to reinterpret and re-understand how we should be reading some of this uh, New Testament material. Just to accentuate the errors in Pharisees being liars, etc., the one book written about the Jewish sects at that time is Josephus. And Josephus said that the Pharisees have the minds of the people, the people follow the Pharisees, and not the Sadducees. So uh, there's a historical comment to reinforce that. But I, I want to ask you a question. The Essenes, there are those who connect uh, John the Baptist to the Essenes, and through that, extend further into making some of their teachings uh, anti-temple, etc. Uh, a, a Jesus approach. And I, I wonder how you would comment on that. The association of John the Baptist with the desert is certainly clear. Whether that would extend as far as a connection with the Essene movement, um, that's, we don't have a whole lot about John, so that would be pushing pretty hard. It's, I, I, I'm thinking that that might be a possibility. But what I think the Gospels work pretty hard to do is to understand that John plays the Elijah role in the Gospels. So they're recognizing John's movement, they're appreciating John's movement, but they're wanting to emphasize that John was preparatory to Jesus. Now, historically, John may not have thought of himself that way as preparatory. He might have thought of himself as uh, a, a prophet in his own right, but as the movements developed, one sort of began to merge into the others, and it seems fairly clear that some of the original disciples of John who followed that movement, seeing in it some hope for the future, that some of that movement did in fact transfer to and become part of the early Jesus movement. So there's a very clear connection, but how that connection developed is actually a really interesting question. Uh, if I could follow up on that. Sure. Um, it's somewhat, it's understandable why people want to connect John the Baptist with uh, Qumran and the wilderness and Elijah. He wears uh, a hairy mantle uh, like Elijah did. But uh, one of the things that one finds here is the New Testament interest in uh, linking Jesus to the prophets once again. Because one thing that's important, we all know who Elijah is. Okay? Um, but one thing that's important to remember about Elijah he does not complete his task. And in, uh, first, in Second Kings 2, he goes to heaven in a fiery chariot, but he has a disciple, Elisha, uh, who gets the hairy mantle, gets twice the power of Elijah, and is far more effective in accomplishing his task than Elijah is. Elijah lives at a time when he's trying to deal with the house of Omri, the dynasty of King Ahab of Israel that he's got problems with, and whatever happens to Elijah, whether he goes to heaven in a fiery chariot, or if Queen Jezebel succeeded in killing him, which was her interest at the time, Elisha, who is Elijah's disciple, succeeds. Elisha is the one who actually not only sees to the overthrow of the house of Omri and anoints by a distance a man by the name of Yehu, an Israelite general, to overthrow the Omri dynasty, which he does, and institutes a new dynasty, but Elisha, who gets less press coverage in our traditions, is the one who is far more active in resurrecting people or bringing the dead back to life. You see this in a number of narratives about Elisha, 
But people don't like Elisha. He kills 42 boys when they tease him for being bald. I mean, if I ever go bald, I can understand that. But um, Elisha is a power figure and a more dangerous figure than Elijah is, but he's also a resurrecting figure. And one of the models that you see in the New Testament is that John the Baptist is indeed the predecessor, just like Elijah is the predecessor to Elisha, John the Baptist is the predecessor to Jesus, and it's Jesus the one who gets the most credit for bringing people back to life just the way that Elisha did. But we don't think about him, but that's an important model that you see in New Testament presentation of Jesus as someone who in effect fulfills the roles or the models presented to him in the prophecy or prophetic narratives of the Hebrew Bible. Okay, so let's get into Moses and Jesus in dialogue. Uh, let's start out. Jesus says to Moses, you know, there are things going on which are not right, which I disagree with. What would he, what would he list in that enumeration? I think that Jesus' comment on the law, on, on the traditions of the ethics of Moses, was much more in line with the prophetic tradition which was to emphasize those aspects of the Mosaic ethic that were getting the least attention. And the least attention was being paid to issues of taking care of the most vulnerable. And so what I see consistent in the Hebrew prophets is a profound sense of compassion for those who are the most vulnerable, represented most powerfully in Jeremiah's phrase, the widow, the orphan, and the foreign. Right? Here we have the three representative cases of the most vulnerable status in ancient Israel. If land was largely under the control and tenure of the male, then if the male of the family is lost, there is potential disaster for the widow, there is potential disaster for the orphan, and the aliens didn't have title to begin with. They are aliens. And if you ask, well, why are aliens living amongst the ancient Israelites? The answer is, well, it's all too familiar. They were agricultural workers. And so one of the most interesting things about the prophetic teaching in regards to the most vulnerable of ancient Israelite society is this prophetic sense, to put it almost this way, God is paying particular attention to how you are treating the most vulnerable of your society. And there are times when some of the prophets seem to suggest this is even more important than certain ritual observations. I mean, you could make that argument about Amos, you could make that argument about Micah, you could make that argument about Isaiah. And so even that idea that we often have in Jesus, that Jesus said, look, people are more important than, other, than, than certain ritual observances, even that can be rooted in the prophetic tradition itself. So one of the reasons why I think that this kind of discussion is important is to recapture not the Christian tradition of prophecies about Jesus, but the, what ought to be the much stronger Christian tradition of Jesus as prophet. And if that's the case, then we're confronted with much more uh, stark and fascinating ethical expectations. Jesus as prophet is much more dangerous than prophecy about Jesus. That's quite safe. It's not always about ethics. I mean, to a degree, how the poor are treated in a society is key to the prophets, but it's not just ethics, it's politics as well. 
And one of the things you find, we've learned in modern America through the ethical monotheism movements of the 19th century and 20th century in which our churches, our synagogues, especially reform uh, tradition, have focused on ethics as the central message of the prophets. But the political has been ignored largely in modern treatments of the prophets and part of that is because we in the United States are trained to think of the separation between church and state. And if a church or if a minister or a rabbi were to preach political sermons, then a church or synagogue would lose its tax-exempt status. And yet those political questions are oftentimes central to the prophets. Um, it's not simply how do we treat our poor, but what happens to our poor when we make a decision to go to war, even if it's for the justice of getting under, out from under the thumb of an oppressor. I mean, for example, if you um, were to take that criteria of treating the poor, the widow, and the orphan, you will find that every monarch in Mesopotamian as well as Israelite and Judean uh, history would have said that's precisely what they do. And if you were to ask the last Democratic and Republican presidents, whether we're looking at Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, uh, Jimmy Carter, or Donald Trump, George W. Uh, George W. Bush, uh, jo uh, uh, his father, George, uh, uh, George Bush, or Ronald Reagan, they would have told you the same thing. We stand for justice. The question is, how do you achieve it? And when you read prophets such as Hosea, it's not just a question of pursuing foreign gods. When you read the book of Hosea, you find out that what he's ticked about is that Israel is in an alliance with the Assyrian Empire that causes them to trade olive oil with Egypt. And he wants to cite the Torah that says, wait a minute, our ancestors came from Aram, not from Assyria. We should be allied with them. And Egypt was our oppressor. Or Isaiah telling Ahaz, trust in your defenses, trust in God. You don't want to have to fight the Arameans and the Israelites because our defenses will take care of us and the better part of wisdom is to trust in God who gave us those uh, defenses and will protect Jerusalem. They'll go away. If you want to look at Jesus' time, revolt was brewing against the Roman Empire. And one of the questions you have to ask is a political one, was it smart to fight the Roman Empire at that time? It was not. Why? The results prove it. The first revolt sponsored by the Zealots resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple. The Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 to 135 nearly succeeded, but the Roman Emperor, Emperor Hadrian was not about to allow Judah to succeed in a revolt, otherwise all of his provinces would revolt. He came to Judea and took personal command of the army and basically oversaw a genocide against the Jewish people to stamp out any sense of revolt there. And one of the things about Jews is that Jews argue. Okay. Jesus, looking at the Pharisees, who are interpreters, calling them hypocrites, you're wrong. Here's the way you should do it. If you look at Jesus, you don't see him among the zealots, although he's got zealots among his disciples. He's a figure that says, wait for God to act. If you fight now, you're going to lose. And it's striking when you look at rabbinic tradition, the Pharisaic tradition, Rabbi Akiva, one of the great sages of rabbinic tradition would argue that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. But in fact, his colleagues told him, Akiva, grass will grow from your cheeks. That is, you'll be dead and buried before you see the Messiah. And when Bar Kokhba and his men were slaughtered by the Romans at Batar, the Romans demonstrated 
that the revolt was a failure. And it's striking, we oftentimes think about the destruction of the temple being the key event. I had the privilege of teaching Ethiopic a couple of years ago. Not many scholars know Ethiopic. But one of the things we read was the apocalypse of Peter that points to what the issue was between Christianity and Judaism. In the apocalypse of Peter, you have Peter arguing, Bar Kokhba was not the Messiah that Jesus had to be the Messiah because Jesus' way would have led to the survival of the people. Bar Kokhba's way led to death. And what happens is that with the genocide against the Jewish people, basically Jewish identity was wiped out in Judea. Jews continued in exile. Christians did too. The early Jewish Christians also died in those revolts. And the Christian communities would then grow up in Gentile areas so that Christianity ended up becoming a Gentile religion in Syria, in Babylonia, and beyond. Judaism maintained a Jewish identity but also went into exile and ended up adapting a great deal of practice from the Babylonian uh, cultures the Roman cultures, the Greek cultures, and others, and continued to develop over time. Both traditions developed, but that key event was the failure of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Should you fight or not, when the forces are able to overwhelm you, it's best to wait for a more opportune time. And you feel Jesus advocated that? Um, there was revolt brewing in the time of Jesus that uh, already there were the, the first vestiges of revolt against the Romans breaking out about uh, 6 CE. I can't remember the name of the, uh, of the leader of the revolt, but the book of Acts mentions one such case of a revolt that was done. It was too early. The Romans put it down quickly, but several other... Eliezer. Uh, no, I think it was somebody else. Anyway, uh, but, there, but there was one, and it ended up leading to three major revolts. The Zealot Revolt, 66 to 74, destruction of the temple. The Diaspora Revolt in Egypt and Cyprus uh, from 114 to 117. And then finally the Bar Kokhba Revolt, 132 to 135. Every one was put down. The Roman Empire was just too powerful. And at times like that, it's best to wait, rely on God to see to the future, that's how I would understand Jesus' uh, message. That's also how I would understand the message of Rabbi Akiva's colleagues. Judea was a backwater to the Romans. Uh, there was no wealth there. There was no... I mean, wh what is the main... the dominant thing you find in Israel today? Rocks. Uh, so th there was no wealth to be stolen from there. So that meant that the Romans would appoint a third tier bureaucrat to be there. And third tier bureaucrats are not good at managing volatile situations. And uh, this is frequently given as, as furthering the cause of the rebellion throughout. But let me, uh, this comment made frequently about the law and that the, the law, meaning the law of Moses, is taken to be overly controlling, perhaps even harsh, whereas the uh, philosophy that evolved from Jesus was more about love. Talk about that. Well, that's actually an interesting question. When I teach the Ten Commandments in class at Loyola Marymount, of course, the vast majority of my students are from the Christian tradition, and we go through the standard Ten Commandments, and then I say, you know, there's a problem with the traditional Ten Commandments, isn't there? And they go, well, no, what's the problem? And I say, the problem is, I want you to now go through those 10 and imagine 
who is being addressed by the Ten Commandments? And of course, their instinctive reaction is to say, well, everybody, of course. And I say, well, now, just a minute. Think about this. If it says, you know, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, well, then clearly a male is being addressed. So if you go through that way and just sort of imagine who's specifically being addressed here, what do you get? Well, I'd like to read to you from uh, a British scholar who's asked this same question. I think you'll enjoy this. He asks, who is envisioned in the Ten Commandments? Who is the narratee supposed by the narrator? It's not difficult to profile the figure. Put together all the data that we have in the commandments, and what we find is this. It's an individual, a male, an Israelite. He's employed, a house owner, married, old enough to have working children, but young enough to have living parents, living in a city, wealthy enough to possess an ox, an ass, and slaves, important enough to be called to give evidence in a lawsuit. It is a man who is capable of committing, and probably tempted to commit, everything that's forbidden here. And likely to ignore everything enjoined here, if not commanded to observe it. And here's his wonderful concluding line. It is, in short, one might say, a balding Israelite urban male in a midlife crisis with a weight problem in danger of losing his faith. Now, I love that quote, and I use it frequently. I know many. <laughs> but, but, but the question I ask is this. So, who then is missing? And then the class starts coming alive and they say, well, children aren't mentioned. I said, that's true. Women aren't mentioned. I said, that's true. Foreigners aren't mentioned. That's true. So then I ask the question, so do you presume that the fullness of the Mosaic ethics, the Mosaic law, does not address women and children and the poor and slaves. And as a matter of fact, they wonder about that. And I say, let me give you my other 10. Now these are other parts of the Mosaic laws that I've chosen to make this point. And amongst those 10 are things like if you come upon a fellow Israelite's field and you are hungry, you may eat. You may eat olives, you may eat grapes. That is not stealing. You may not put any in a basket and take them out. That's stealing. That's harvesting your neighbor's crop. But if you are hungry, the Mosaic Law says you have the right to not be hungry. And Marvin already made a mention of the laws of gleaning that says when you gather up your grapes, when you gather up your olives, you are not to take every last grape on the vine. You are not to strip every last olive off the tree. You are to leave some for the poor. Well, and then I go through more and more of these kind of laws. Uh, the fact, for example, in Deuteronomy that you must treat aliens with the same justice by which you treat each other as fellow Israelites. That's quite striking. But here's the interesting phenomenon. I come to the end of my other 10, and frequently a student will raise their hand and say, those laws sound like Jesus. I say, yeah, exactly. The only way that we get away with contrasting Jesus with the Old Testament laws is if we're only talking about a very rigid interpretation of the famous ten. Then we can get away with that. If we expand, however, to an awareness of the richness of the Mosaic Law that includes such incredibly compassionate laws about the poor, about slaves. By the way, if a slave, that is someone who's repaying that debt that Marvin talked about, if a slave comes to you saying, I'm being mistreated by the one that I'm paying the debt off to, you must not send them back. You must offer them asylum. Let me pause and say something about that. And in, in, in saying something about that, I agree completely with my colleague Marvin that, that, that these things have political implications. You understand 
that when the southern slaveholding states and the northern states complicit in this allowed the passage of the fugitive slave law, that is, the right of slaveholders to chase run runaway slaves into northern states. When that law was accepted, that was a direct violation of the laws of Moses. Absolutely direct violation. When someone comes to you seeking asylum, you must offer them asylum. You must not send them back. That's the Mosaic law. So, I would choose to say it this way. Jesus, like the prophets, leaned towards one side of the Mosaic law. It wasn't against the Mosaic law. It was leaning towards one side of it. Pay attention to this aspect. That's the one we need to pay the most attention to. So I would suggest that Jesus was very much in following and in keeping with much of the Mosaic law, that it was a matter of emphasis and not a matter of particular ethics. Well, the asylum cities, which are also in the Mosaic law, yeah. how do you fit that into what you just said? Well, again, uh, you have to go to a certain place and you got to get there. Right. To, to receive asylum. That was a, that was a case of uh, involuntary manslaughter. Where, yeah. Um, but I'm talking about just somebody who's working for you to pay off a debt. If they feel that they have been abused in that relationship. In other words, this was not supposed to be an abusive relationship. This was supposed to be essentially fair employee-employer relations. And if they weren't fair, the contract was off. And you could go to, uh, to the next neighbor, as it were, and say, I need shelter. I'm being abused over here. And the Mosaic law was, you give them shelter. So it's, it's no surprise to me that Judaism has been at the forefront throughout European history of movements for compassionate social change. That's hardly a surprise. When one knows the fullness of the Mosaic Law and the prophetic emphasis on precisely emphasizing that compassionate fullness of the Mosaic Law, then it's hardly a mystery why Jews have been at the forefront of major movements union organizing, major movements for equal rights, major movements for um, positive treatment of immigrants. I mean, movement after movement after movement, labor parties uh, in European history, at the center of those movements, you will 99% of the time find Jewish activists. And there's a very good reason for that. Um, I am troubled by the fact that at the center of many of those movements for positive social change were Jews. I'm not troubled by that part. I'm troubled by the fact that non-Jews who were a part of those movements tended to be very anti-religious. In other words, where were the committed Christians at the center of those movements for positive social change. There were occasionally some. I've been working, I was in London last semester teaching in our program, and while there I began to learn about one of the founders of the British Labour Party, Keir Hardy. Keir Hardy was an incredible, interesting man. A minor, self-taught, fiery Scot, deeply committed socialist, and passionately committed Christian, whose speeches for social change, speeches for the beginning of the British Labour Party, were laced with scripture. I'm troubled by how rare that is in European and indeed even American movements for positive social change. It's not so unusual in Judaism to find Jewish leaders at the center of those movements. It's more unusual to find committed Christians 
at the center of those movements. And I'm deeply troubled by that, my brothers and sisters. So we're, we're continually on a separation of ethical laws or a specialization of ethical laws, and we're ignoring cult laws, religious <coughs> laws. Where does that fit in? Do you lose, what do you lose by doing that? Well, like I, like I said before, um, in our culture, we presuppose the distinction between ethical laws and ritual laws. Um, the Hebrew Bible does not. Uh, read uh, texts like Leviticus 19, and you see an intermixture of the, uh, of the ritual and the ethical, because they're all one and the same as far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned. And what's so interesting about it is that um, our own preoccupation with the religious side um, oftentimes fails to understand how these laws were meant to function. When we read, for example, the, uh, the statements in the Torah that are legal, what we're looking at are templates for action. If we think about, you know, uh, charges that, well, is the law oppressive? Well, if you're the kind of guy who wants to covet your neighbor's wife uh, or property or whatnot, and that law then prevents you from doing so, you might see it from oppressive. Others might consider it a matter of justice. And it's striking to think about the evolution of law in the ancient world, as well as the modern world. American law goes back to British law. Um, if we were to put the Magna Carta up as the template of what represents contemporary American law, we would have a very inaccurate description of what that might mean. And to take the text of the Torah as literally as some interpreters do also is problematic. Let me give you an example. You're all familiar with the statement of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, life for life, etc. And when, yet when you see that three times in the Torah, one in Exodus, one in Leviticus, and one in Deuteronomy, it's a law that actually expresses a sense of ideals. What does it mean? Does it mean that if somebody puts your eye out, do you have the right to put theirs out? Or if somebody takes your life, or somebody you love's life, do you have the right to be a vigilante and go out and kill them as well? The rabbis of antiquity looked at that law and asked, what is a law like this supposed to teach? For example, and this may seem a little bit nitpicky, but think about the potential for justice here. Suppose a one-eyed man puts your eye out. Is it the case that the punishment should be put his eye out? Or if you've ever watched The Fugitive, if a one-armed man murders somebody, do you cut his arm off or what? You know, anyway. Um, when you think about the application of the law, of that law, the rabbis of the Talmud looked at that and said, if you were to put out the eye of a one-eyed man, that would be a greater punishment for him. That's not what this law must be about. And they decided that when you think about the various statements here, the purpose is to find a way to enable a criminal to give back something of what he or she has done to the victim. If that person has put out their eye or cut off a hand or resulted in injury of somewhat, that in a, a society of agricultural labor, manual labor, what does it mean to lose your hand or to lose your eye? And what the rabbis decided is that it didn't mean you should go out poking out criminals' eyes or cutting off their hands as some traditions maintain. What it means is that the person who's done this to you has to give you some kind of compensation, generally understood as monetary compensation or working for you. If someone has injured your hand or your eye so that you can no longer work and provide food, shelter, and whatnot for your family, the criminal in this case is obligated to pay to you 
what he or she has taken for you or go to work for you to replace what you can no longer provide. And so the rabbis reasoned that if you do this, you actually create a more ideal and just society because if you go around cutting off eyes in people, you result in injured people who themselves cannot take care of their families, but if you put them to work for the victims that they victimized, you put them to constructive work, you replace what has been lost, even if you can't give them back their hand, you can at least replace the food that they would have grown or produced otherwise. And this becomes a way not only to provide the victims uh, compensation for what they've lost, but also the opportunity to teach the perpetrator of a crime something and put that perpetrator to effective work. Okay, that's when you start to think, how is law is applied? And when you think about the interrelationship between ritual and ethics, the need to go to the temple, the need to recognize observance of Shabbat, the need to recognize observance of the holidays is way, are ways to remind people in those temples that we live in a holy world and when we act contrary to that holiness, we disrupt that holy world. It is our task as human beings to act as partners with God to maintain the holiness of, of the world, to recognize going to temple or synagogue on Shabbat or church on Sunday is a way to remind us of our holy obligations. And that's the point that ritual reminds us in our world that the ethical is part of holiness as well. I can see in a dialogue between Moses and Jesus uh, about the law that Moses would say, according to tradition, God gave me these laws at Sinai. And according to the deeper tradition, not only the Ten Commandments, but the Pentateuch, the Torah, was given to Moses. So these are God's laws. And yet, many people pick and choose among them as to what they're going to do and still say it's God's law on what they're going to follow, but not on what they choose to, to ignore. And uh, I, 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 I'm sure Jesus would disagree with the extent of the law because he says that in many different ways as to what law is most binding and what is least binding. And I can see that Jesus and Moses are not going to come to a common ground on this thing, I don't think. Where do you see it going? Uh, well, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic with where uh, uh, Marvin was going with his analysis, which was uh, a lot of this has to do less with the letter of the law than it does with the interpretation of the law. Um, and we're now in a process of understanding that this notion of Christianity, which, you know, let me just summarize this another way. I don't even like, you probably noticed, I don't even like using the phrase mosaic law. I like referring to the mosaic ethic. And the reason I say that is because Christians have this kind of knee-jerk reaction to the phrase mosaic law. And that knee-jerk reaction is, oh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And when you say mosaic ethic, it's a lot harder to be dismissive because we certainly have ethics. So that, hopefully that would make us pause and say, well, wait a minute, ethics, well, okay, keep talking. Because we are interested in ethics. We are interested in interpreting how is it we are supposed to live as the people of God. And so I'm much more interested in seeing the New Testament as a tradition of interpretation of the Mosaic ethic. Because I do not see that the New Testament is a summary dismissal 
of the Mosaic ethic. I just don't see that. I see some occasional disagreements where a person would say, now it's usually been said this way. As a matter of fact, that sounds rather familiar. You've heard it said, but I say. I don't think that's a dismissal. I think that's a reinterpretation, which is very much part of the rabbinic tradition to reinterpret and to go in a different direction and to emphasize different things. And again, Jesus seems to sound, the more you're familiar with particularly first century Pharisaic teachers, again, like my hero, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the more you realize Jesus sounds very much at home in this discussion and in this debate. Is there an ethical part to the dietary law? If you follow Leviticus, was it 19, I believe? Was, Absolutely. Now, explain how that has an ethical content. Uh, not to, to eat only a fish which has fins and scales. Mm -hmm. That's, there's ethics in that? Yes, it's a way of controlling human violence. Uh, you see this already in Genesis 9, the shedding of blood. And what the kosher dietary laws do is they limit the number of animals that might be killed. Um, today, CNN was watching, uh, there's a lot of Olympic coverage going on, and one of the stories they ran uh, was um, about the 17,000 um, uh, dog meat producing producers in Korea and what activists were doing to try to shut down the eating of dog meat um, and pointing out, well, they're, they're pets and whatnot. But the fact of the matter is the eating of meat altogether uh, involves the shedding of blood. And what Kashrut tries to do is limit that. Uh, it limits the numbers of animals that may be killed for meat, and it specifies how those animals are supposed to be killed. Um, the way it's supposed to be done is that you use a very sharp knife to basically slit the artery, allow the animal to bleed to death, fall asleep basically, um, if it's done properly, um, and so thereby to lessen the pain. Now, that's in a culture that accepts the eating of meat. Uh, what many Jewish uh, thinkers have come to recognize is that the idea of eating meat might not even be the solution at all, uh, but rather to move to more of a vegetarian diet, um, which uh, my wife is doing right now, um, and she's finding that she has dropped weight in a healthy way, that uh, she no longer has pain in her legs uh, or arms and whatnot. And when you think about the uh, merits of a vegetarian diet, one of the things to recognize is that when I was born, back in the last millennium, um, there were 25, two and a half billion people on planet Earth. Today, there are seven billion, uh, just in my lifetime. And the question is, how do we feed all those people? If we feed them meat-based diets, it actually takes enough vegetable matter that could feed, I don't know exactly how many, seven to 10 people to produce enough meat to feed one person. And so if meat were to be eliminated, not only would that be in keeping with kashrut, it would end the violence against animals in general, and you could feed more people on a diet that focused on grains, rice, vegetables, fruits, and you would have better health. We human beings, in many respects, we benefited from eating meat. We grew bigger, which meant that we need to eat more. But we also developed things like coronary artery disease, heart attacks, strokes, and whatnot. That comes in uh, especially from eating meat. So one of the things that we have not yet learned from Jewish tradition is that the idea of limiting meat might just be the first step uh, in, the, uh, in the tradition that ultimately going to a vegetarian diet, which would be completely cult, uh, kosher, would prevent us from eating meat, would prevent us from eating dogs, would prevent us from engaging in genocide, if you will, against cattle uh, and fish. If you uh, look at the fish that you buy in the supermarket today, much of it is actually raised 
um, in which the fish are in conditions in which they do not live any kind of a real life. They're just packed into water and they suffer. And one of the questions is, is this what human food should be made of? Animals that are deliberately made to suffer um, or should we be thinking of other ways to prevent that from happening? Well, you've given a contemporary overview of this, but yes. if you put it in terms of the biblical period, you don't come out in the same way, I don't think. That's because ancient Jews lived in mountain countries. Um, the way to produce food, you didn't have, I'm from Illinois, central Illinois, where you have broad flat plains, or you can uh, plant large uh, num uh, large amounts of grain, corn, soybeans, you name it. If you live in the mountains, you have to use terrace farming, which actually gives you a limited uh, production of wheat, barley, grain, and whatnot. And in effect, you rely more on meat um, because you can have them eat, you can have the animals eat grass, you can use the animals for wool, you can milk the animals uh, and, uh, and produce milk and cheese, but that becomes a way of producing meat that's consistent with an environment. If you're in the coastal plain, you can plant grain. And so one of the things to consider is what role does environment play in relation to food production? Um, we live in California. Drive up Interstate 5 sometime, um, and especially if you've done that in the last, uh, last five to 10 years, you've seen the devastating effects of the, um, of the drought we've suffered. But bear in mind, California has been one of the bread baskets of the United States. Um, our central spine produces when we don't suffer from drought. Um, about 40% of the agricultural produce grown and consumed in the United States. There are ways to deal with that. We can use water desalinization. Uh, in fact, we've already started their desalinization plants uh, in Ventura County, down in San Diego, and elsewhere. Is modern Israel has used this because they've got a problem with water now, and they've been able to replenish the water supplies there and make their agricultural um, uh, produce um, less, uh, uh, less invasive on animal life and more productive in, vegetable, in the use of vegetables, all of which is completely consistent with kashrut. This might be what it means to keep learning Torah over the course of generations and generations and why the rabbis would keep saying that uh, for any of us, we are not, ob we are, uh, not obligated to, um, uh, we are obligated to engage in the work, but we are not obligated to complete it. Other generations will take the work further than we do and this might be one of the ways in which we would go. Moses and Jesus in dialogue. What would they say about God and their relationship to God and their concept of God? Would they be the same? Would they be different? Well, I think there's a different emphasis there. Uh, the Hebrew literature is much more comfortable with uh, descriptions of God that run the range of human emotions. So, I mean, I, I think there's ways of rendering this that's a little bit less shocking for us. For example, referring to the wrath of God or to the anger of God, or, or the anger of God breathing through God's nostrils. And so, the, I mean, this, this incredible, rich imagery, but it can be quite uh, upsetting in other cultural contexts and other time contexts. I think that we are familiar with, a, no, it's not completely absent in the New Testament, but certainly, I think, in the Christian tradition, we like to think that Jesus was a little bit less pushy on the wrath talk and a little bit more pushy on the love talk. Um, 
it is a contrast that I think is real, but I think it's a contrast that can be overdone. But we need to work on what we understand the biblical language to be trying to do by attributing human emotions to God. Um, that can get quite problematic if we get too literalistic about it. And I wanted to back up and, and comment about something that you asked before, and that is ethics and ritual. Now, I come at this from an interesting perspective, and that is I grew up in the Quaker tradition, about as least a ritual tradition of Christianity as that there exists, right? But I've been working for the Roman Catholics for 30 years now, and I have appreciated many of the things that I have learned from my Catholic friends. Uh, Protestant dismissal of many aspects of Catholic ritual, I think are hasty and not very well informed. For example, it is common for Protestants to say, I don't need to confess my sins to another person. I can just confess my sins to God. I don't need another person. Why do those Catholics do that? Well, what I've learned from my Catholic brothers and sisters is the incredible power not only of sharing what is troubling you but of actually hearing the words from another human being in the name of God you are forgiven now there isn't a single Protestant on the face of the earth that should demean that as a powerful experience anyone who's ever had someone that they've wronged say, I forgive you. And to hear those words, understand how powerful it is to hear a priest say, in the name of God, you are forgiven. That is a powerful thing. And as a Quaker, I've learned that. Now, here's the problem. The problem that I see with religious rituals, whether they are biblical rituals or later rituals developed in various Christian traditions, because, of course, many Christian traditions have different rituals. I see... I see the problem as this. When a ritual is no longer inviting you to the experience of God, it becomes a problem. When a ritual becomes something that someone says, you must do this, or you are unacceptable, then they've completely, in my opinion, they have completely misunderstood the purpose of ritual. The purpose of ritual is an invitation to a greater experience of the life of faith. As soon as it becomes something else, as soon as it becomes a rigid requirement, then I agree with the reformers over the years that have said, no, 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 that's not the right way to think about ritual. Because it's become rigid. It's become something that is detracting from the life of faith, not something that's invitational. I once asked my teacher of Judaism, why do I feel so drawn to Jewish ritual and so put off by some aspects of Christian ritual in various traditions? And he had one thing to say to me. He said, because in the Jewish tradition, we're inviting you to this ritual. We're not demanding it of you. That said an awful lot to me, my friends. And I've thought about that ever since. For those for whom this is an invitation, that it's a vital part of their faith journey, then ritual is a beautiful and wonderful thing. For those who feel oppressively demanded to engage in an act that they don't feel invited to at all, they just feel demanded, then that has completely and radically changed the meaning of ritual. And that's where I think we have quite rightly have had traditions of criticism of ritual where they become demands rather than invitations. And yet at the same time, and I, I don't want to overemphasize ritual, but ritual is what gives the depth to a religion and what makes one religion different from another. Yeah. If, if there were no ritual, we'd, it would all be ethical and, and nothing really religious, which I always find fascinating because there are people who think that the interfaith 
movement, the interfaith thoughts, are to bring everybody into some great little cluster of beliefs that are universal. And it's absolutely wrong. That's not what interfaith is all about. It's about understanding the richness of our neighbor's religion and, and learning from that. Yes. Yes. Uh, so ritual, I, I certainly those who are demanding and, 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 and overdoing the thing, that's a separate problem, but, but you, you need ritual within, within religion. Yes. Okay, now, I promised you guys some time. You want to take five minutes? You can't have ten now, you can have five. Okay, I got my watch here. Um, let me just uh, give a concluding remark about that demand for ritual or religious identification. Um, as we all know, Christianity oftentimes asserts that one can be saved only through Christ. Islam asserts that one can only be authentic only if one is Muslim. Uh, other traditions make similar demands that the whole world must convert or somehow follow their teachings. Think about what that has done in human history. One of the, right. <laughs> One of the things that Judaism came to realize, because there were times when we were demanding the conversions of others as well. If you read the Bible, 2 Samuel 8, uh, when David forces the conversion of the Edomites uh, and kills off, what, about a third of them or two-thirds. Uh, likewise, Herod, whose father was an Idumean who was forced to convert to Judaism. We figured out that doesn't work the consequences are too great. And so what happened is that rabbinic Judaism developed a notion of called the laws of Noah. That is, for Jews to recognize an authentic religion, there are certain things that they're supposed to do, set up courts of law, um, practice justice in their traditions, um, do not eat uh, blood with meat or eat living meat uh, alive, which is what kashrut uh, is, uh, is understood to be about, and basically gave a set of ethical directives that included recognition of God in whatever way a tradition might recognize God. And one can see that even in Buddhism, uh, at least with certain of us who understand it that way. But basically what Judaism calls for is recognition of a multi-religious world in which each tradition brings its insights into conversation. Not all people need to be Jewish, but all people do need to think about what is the divine or what is ultimate reality and learn to act upon from their tradition and implement justice and sanctity within their worlds. In fact, Micah, and I know uh, Professor Smith Christopher has um, uh, written a commentary on Micah. Micah makes a statement after the Swords into Plowshares passage that every, every tradition follows the rules of its own God. And the laws of Noah actually take off from that statement in Micah. That's one of their inspirations for understanding this. But that gives us the chance to live in a world in which we can both recognize and also learn from the traditions of others while holding fast to our own. Elie Wiesel, at the beginning of a book he wrote called Souls on Fire about Eastern European Judaism, begins with a statement that from within one's own tradition, and it wasn't just Judaism, it was any tradition, one can say anything to God. That's a statement that I see as recognizing that each religious tradition has its own perspectives, that we can learn from them and learn to cooperate with each other, and that is what I would see, and I think Judaism would see as, rec as recognizing the ideal and the holy in the world in which we live. Your five minutes. I want to reiterate that I believe that there are not 
only ethical teachings, but also ritual practices that different Christian groups have come to understand are helpful for their life of faith. Let me just refer to one that I'm kind of interested in. There's a small Russian Christian group that Tolstoy was very interested in. It's a group called the Dukabors. During their very interesting religious services, the Dukabors would turn to each other and bow towards each other twice. And then they'd turn and bow towards another person twice. And if you ask them, what are they doing in this ritual? They would say, we are bowing to the presence of God in each other. Now, we're all sitting there probably think the same thing that I thought when I first heard this, and you're going, oh, that's cool. I like that. But imagine that a person who said that to you then saying, and furthermore, you better do that or you're a bad Christian. It's ruined. That moment is suddenly gone. It, for a minute there, you were drawn to something that seemed wonderful. And in another second, it's, it's gone. That, I think, is how we need to recover our sense of ritual richness as invitational and not demanding. You know, I was asked one time to read a document that was going to be part of uh, a local document for the uh, Archdiocese of Los Angeles. So I, I was asked to read through this even as a non-Catholic. And uh, so much of the language in this document was, we must, we must, we must. And they asked me, what did you think about that document? And I said, it sounds to me like it was written by someone terrified that they were losing their tradition and making demands. Where in this is the joy of the Catholic tradition? Where in this is the privilege of the Catholic tradition? Where is the incredible insights and gifts that have been given to us through the Catholic tradition? I, I don't see that joy in this document. I, I think how we look at our ritual expressions is crucially important because I think an awful lot of reform, angry reform movements have sometimes been keyed and set off by ritual being demanding rather than invitation. And for those of us, all of us here who have learned from other traditions, we're, we know that experience. My wife and I love yoga. Well, yoga is borrowed from another religious tradition. It's wonderful, it's healthy, it's great, it's fantastic. But would it have gotten that far if the people who practice yoga, and furthermore, you must do this or you are a bad human, that would ruin it. People would turn away from it and say, I want nothing to do with that. And rightly so. So let's, let's regain a sense of the appreciation of what we learn from each other as invitational in our ritual lives. Thank you for this event, Bob. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, March 6th is the next uh, dawn panel. We're going to talk about the responsibilities of a modern clergy in this world of single interest people and strongly advocating one thing. I sympathize with our clergy for having to manage a congregation of people like that. So March 6th at the Mormon stake. Now please join us for some interfaith cookies. Thank you all. <laughs>